I am truly honored to be in this magnificent library this evening. Great art, books, wonderful friends, and C-SPAN. Who could want for more? Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to everyone who made this evening possible. The gracious Paula Matthews, the uh, lively uh, Monica Higgins, who seems to make the clocks run on time, but most of all, our friends Anne and Hans Ziegler. Thank you so very much. Allow me to introduce you to my subjects, or protagonists, as it were. Dorothy Thompson on the right, and Rebecca West to your left. Here they are at the height of their careers in the 1930s and at the height of their beauty, I might add. They don't know it yet, but they're about to embark upon a self-defining morality play at my behest. And I can almost hear them talking to one another. Dorothy first with her high-pitched pseudo-British accent. Becky, dear, don't you think it was divine intervention that swayed Susan to write our stories? And Rebecca would have replied in her best Betty Davis drawl. Oh, poppycock. Just let the old girl talk. I don't know about you, Dottie, but I am certain she couldn't possibly puncture my polished persona to the core. Perhaps they are both right. Nonetheless, I am glad you are here and frankly that they are not. <laughs> and so I begin. While researching the Lindbergh story, I became aware of just how crucial the period between the two world wars were, was, in defining the great moral issues of the 20th century, women's rights, nationalism versus internationalism, democracy, versus totalitarianism. While Anne Lindbergh was constrained by her husband's fame and later by his infamy, this time I wanted to write about women who had had the guts to confront the cataclysmic issues of their day head on. While combing through the daily newspapers and magazines in Britain and America, two names kept cropping up, Dorothy Thompson and Rebecca West. I wanted to know why their bold, uncompromising voices seemed to be everywhere, in newspapers, periodicals, magazines, books, even on the radio. And the more I learned, the more I was intrigued by these extraordinary women who seemed to spring out of nowhere from humble roots, self-educated, voraciously ambitious, and hell-bent on changing the course of history. Despite the odds of breaking into the male-dominated media, West and Thompson were able to rise above their poverty, defy social convention, and succeed in a way many women had not done before, forging a path in literature and in journalism for women today. For 40 years, Rebecca West 
took Britain by storm, pouring her thoughts out into essays, articles, books, ranging from literary criticism to biography and history, addressing a dizzying array of issues, female enfranchisement, the dangers of nationalism, the ethics of war, the meaning of treason, war crimes and justice. While Dorothy Thompson's tenure at the top would last no longer than two decades, and her primary vehicles were print and broadcast journalism, she would address the very same issues with equal depth and passion on an international scale, earning the respect of presidents and prime ministers. Born one year apart on opposite sides of the Atlantic, both of British heritage, Weston Thompson came of age in the 1920s amid two decades of political, economic, and social upheaval that ineluctably pushed the world toward conflagration for the second time. Western civilization was in crisis, and they were among the very first to recognize and articulate, articulate the threats the threats of fascism that were sweeping through Europe in the 1930s, while most of their colleagues, male or female, refused to acknowledge the blatant signs of Nazi imperialism. West and Thompson fought the only way they could, not on the military battlefield, but in the arena of ideas. Willing to risk everything and smashing literary and social icons in their wake. Rebecca West, nay Cicely Isabel Fairfield, was nothing if not iconoclastic. Sicily, the youngest of three daughters, was born in 1892 on the outskirts of London. Her father, a gifted journalist and cartoonist, soon revealed to be a notorious gambler, thief, and womanizer, abandoned their family when Sicily was only eight years old. Devastated, she was unable to recognize, to reconcile his apparent adoration with the penury and shame into which his leaving had cast them. This, I believe, was the defining moment of her life. Her father's betrayal forever destroyed her faith in people and in God, permeating every aspect of her life, including her writing. She would search for him in all her relationships with men, and in her own way, she set out to become him. Aware that her beauty, intelligence, and verbal acuity was akin to his, she methodically cast aside extraneous attachments in service to her overarching ambition. Her life became a game of chess. Believing that the formal schooling of a woman such as herself was a waste of time, she educated herself in classical literature, history, and moral philosophy. By the time she was 19 years old, Sicily, 
now known as Rebecca West, the protagonist of a